When a young reporter asked rookie NASCAR driver Jeff Gordon 30 years ago whether he had ever skipped school to attend Indianapolis 500 practice, Gordon delivered a quick reply. You sound like someone who speaks from experience, he said. I laughed, and whether I did or I didn't, Jeff Gordon certainly had partaken in the common ritual for high school students in the area. Uh, yeah, I think it was my senior year in high school, there was a group of us that, that definitely um, took off that day, called in sick, whatever it was, and went over to the uh, Speedway. I don't know what day uh, of the week or you know, what was going on that day, but I remember it was a heck of a party and a lot of fun going on, and we had a great time. The idea of teenagers skipping school was much more accepted in Indianapolis than stock cars racing on the hallowed Indianapolis Motor Speedway grounds. I can remember longtime Indy 500 car owner Tony Bettenhausen telling me he wouldn't let those taxi cabs in his garage. Oh, those taxi cabs came and they caused a heck of a ruckus. And the fleet is out. <laughs> As NASCAR returns to Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the 30th anniversary of the 1994 inaugural Brickyard 400, the memories of August 6, 1994 stick in my mind. I'm here to explain what you kids don't know about that event. The buildup to that race probably ranked bigger than any race in NASCAR history. In June 1992, NASCAR invited nine teams to a tire test at the famed 2.5 mile paperclip shaped track. More than 30,000 people flocked to the Speedway and thousands more were turned away because the track had not opened more parking lots. We rolled in there and we rolled out on the racetrack. And I think every driver that was at that test, it was like, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the feeling you had when you walked into the Daytona 500 facility. But because of the history goes back, from, you know, back then and to the turn of the century, the legends that have been, you know, on that track, there was a special feeling in the air. We were there, yes, it was called a Goodyear tire test, but we all knew that it was a bigger, it was a bigger project ahead. As momentum built to NASCAR's arrival at Indianapolis, not everyone in the stock car world even felt sold on the idea. Indianapolis Motor Speedway stood solely as a sanctuary for open wheel cars for more than 80 years. The flat, narrow track didn't lend itself to the heavier plodding stock cars. Sit in the turns and watching cars go 220 miles an hour at the Indianapolis 500 made the cup cars going 160 look incredibly slow. What would fans think if they saw the slower cars not racing as frenetic as their IndyCar counterparts? Many in NASCAR didn't care. The drivers just wanted to answer the question when asked if they race at Indianapolis. They could now respond with a resounding yes, albeit not the race that many had associated with the track. Well, most drivers thought that way. Kyle Petty at first refused to even test at the track and told his owner, Felix Sabatis, to decline the invitation. I remember telling Felix, I'm not going. And he's like, why? And I said, because stock cars don't belong in Indy. That's just how simple it is. We had Daytona. That's our Mecca. That, that's our holy ground. Um, they had Indy. That's their place. That's not our place. You don't play croquet at Augusta. You play golf. You, you know what I mean? That, that's just the way it is. Ricky Rudd used to buy parts from IndyCar teams, parts he knew would make his car faster. He could tell how those IndyCar folks felt about him racing at Indianapolis. They didn't come off mean or even condescending, as much as just matter of fact believing stock cars did not belong at the Brickyard. The only thing I know is I saw some of the comments in the newspapers that Indy when we showed up, and some of the guys, you know, you know, go back down south where you belong, type, you know, type, you know, in a nice way. But they, you know, they felt that uh, they, they felt that it was sort of uh, against the culture to let us come in there. After the successful tire test, NASCAR conducted another full test at the track in 1993. They had already announced that NASCAR would race there in 1994, and the fans and drivers came prepared. Dave Marcus told me he actually sold sponsorship just for that test. And the fans, they showed up in droves. It was incredible. The garage area was a zoo. People climbing up over the fences, trying to get in. Fans there trying to get autographs. It was nuts, and you know, and that just continued to build the hype all the way until uh, the race weekend and race day, and and it was just, you know, to this day, I I, I think, you know, one of the 
uh, most sought after, most hyped events and, and most successful events that I can think of in, in NASCAR history. As I talked to Gordon about the 1994 Brickyard 400, he stood by the car since refurbished that won the race. I asked him to tell me what made that car special and he told me something that I wouldn't know. Well, there's a few, few things that made it really special. One of them you can't see because it's under the hood. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of horsepower uh, for, for that race. Everyone needed horsepower for that race. Rusty Wallace tested four cars and nine engines during the team's private testing at the track in the months leading up to the race. 86 cars showed up for the 43 spots, which has 40 spots available on speed and three provisionals. AJ Foy barely made the field, a huge feat for the most accomplished racer and another thrill to the Indy crowd. Marcus, who failed to qualify for eight races that season in a car he owned, but who had solid equipment for the Brickyard that he obtained from RCR through his role as Earnhardt's primary test driver, remembers the elation of just making the race when he qualified 16th. It put him in a world of his own. When we qualified that day, I, a lot of the team members remember it, but my wife, I guess, we were walking back to the truck out in the infield, and uh, she was walking towards us. And they said, I just walked right by her. And, and I mean, I was, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I was just happy to be qualified that well, I guess. And uh, I, I guess I just said hi and kept right on walking. Rick Mast won the poll, just the second poll of his career. It shocked everyone. Mast can tell a story that I bet you kids don't know about his ride with Dale Earnhardt in a truck after they were introduced as the front row for this monumental event in front of the largest crowd ever to see a stock car race. We were riding around uh, on the, in the parade lap and Earnhardt and, me, and I, and anyhow, we came down the front stretch and Earnhardt looked at me and says, Rick, can you believe all these friggin' people here to here watch us, right? So the Intimidator was truly intimidated. Earnhardt and Mast actually bantered about who would lead the first lap while they waved to the fans. But anyhow, he looked at me and said, Rick, you know, I'm going to lead that first lap. I said, go for it, big boy, right? So I knew kind of what he had planned, and I had the inside groove, and we went through one and two. And then when he got in the gas on the outside of me, he tried to hit me a little bit. We did our thing, but he got in it, and his car was a little tight. But he stayed wide open in it. That's why he brushed the wall, right? He was bound and determined to try to lead that first lap. And when I seen him brush the wall, then I'm like, well, we got this now. We got it now. <laughs> that first lap turned in race conditions in a NASCAR Cup race at the Brickyard was one of the race-defining laps of the 160 that day. Everybody wanted to be a part of history. Everybody wanted to, to also make history, which maybe that was the case. And, you know, in lap one, it seemed like Earnhardt was super aggressive, wanting to lead that very first lap. I know that, um, that event meant a lot to him, like so many uh, of us. Um, you know, whether you grew up watching stock cars or grew up watching open wheel and Indy cars, that, that place is just hollow ground. If anything surprised Gordon of what happened at Indy, it came on that first lap. Earnhardt usually didn't mess up that early and take himself out of contention. Man, the green flag dropped and he was, he was going for it. Yeah, it was kind of uncharacteristic of, of Dale to, uh, to get in the wall on that, that first lap and, and you know, make that mistake because it kind of took him out. I think he was gonna definitely be one of the guys to beat. Um, they were strong, they qualified strong, and, and he, uh, you know, he, he looked good in practice. So, uh, yeah, that, 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 that ruined his day. As the race progressed, Jeff Bodine appeared as one of the favorites. His team had produced cars that could run well at the high-speed flat intermediate ovals. He used Hoosier tires at the time, known to potentially run a little faster, but also being a little bit more unpredictable. The tire war ended that year when Hoosier exited the sport, and Indianapolis will go down in history as one of the last true battles of NASCAR tire manufacturers. Boudin drove for the team he owned, which he bought after Alan Kowicki's death. And he had country music star Tanya Tucker at the track as his guest. Rumors flew that they were dating. ESPN interviewed Tucker on television. If Bodine could win this race, it would create storylines at so many levels. It seemed all fun and part of the big game celebrity type atmosphere until the wreck. Here's an interesting thing about the Bodines in that race. All three Bodine brothers, Jeff, Brett, and Todd, led a lap. <laughs> Brett apparently wanted to lead more. In a dicey battle for the lead, Brett turned Jeff. And then Jeff goes on television and airs some inside family beef. 
Yeah, uh, Brett spun me out. Uh, we've had some family problems and personal problems between us here lately, and he just unfortunately took it out on uh, the racetrack with me and uh, never expected he'd do it. He's my brother, I still love him, but he spun me out. It didn't surprise Gordon to see the Bodine brothers wreck each other. He had seen how they raced one another in his short time in the Cup Series. I don't remember hearing a whole lot about any kind of family drama that was going on, but I, I'd seen Jeff and Brett race one another uh, in the two years or year and a half that I'd been in the Cup Series. And it, I was like, wow, you know, I couldn't tell if they just, you know, had a, a brotherly rivalry or they just didn't like one another or what was going on, but uh, they, they raced one another really hard. So that day, I mean, I, I don't think Brett meant to get into the back of them and spin them, but um, they certainly weren't cutting any slack to one another either. And, and so, you know, that's the way it unfolded. I remember after that race writing, to err is human, but to forgive Bodine, we truly didn't know if they could mend their strained brother relationship, but they did. They have long put it behind them, and Jeff Bodine tells me he considers family more important than any trophy. The Bodine feud was just one of a handful of rough accidents at the Brickyard. Jimmy Spencer went to the hospital for x-rays on his shoulder. Mike Chase went to the hospital for x-rays to his neck. For those of us there, the speeds, the wrecks, the huge crowd created an energy and intensity that blew our minds, especially as it came down toward the end of the race. With Bodine no longer a factor, Gordon and Rusty Wallace and Ernie Irvin emerged as the drivers to beat. Gordon and Wallace banged each other on a restart with 27 laps to go after Wallace beat Gordon off pit road. But a lap later, Wallace faded and couldn't get back to the leaders. Gordon and Irvin then staged an epic battle for the lead. Irvin diced his way out front, then Gordon, then Irvin, then Gordon. Gordon explained why they traded the lead so often, probably something you couldn't see just by watching the race in person or on film. The unique thing about that race, especially as it unfolded towards the end, was if in order to be good in traffic, you know, you kind of had to have the front fenders flared out a little bit. You had to have the car really turning uh, because you could get tight in traffic. And we had that, both he and I had that, but as soon as you would get in clean air, it would plant the front and be really loose. For me, I'd get the lead going to the next corner and just, you know, walk in the back end around, just could not get the throttle down. And so it just allowed that car behind you, especially if they had good straightaway speed to, uh, to use the draft. And so, yeah, we were just going back and forth, back and forth. With five laps to go, Irvin had a right front tire go flat and Gordon cruised to the victory. Gordon fans probably remember this as one of his biggest moments where they saw it live or not and possibly find it hard to fathom that one of his greatest wins came in just his second cup victory. After Gordon drove into victory lane, the president of the Speedway at the time, Tony George, presented Gordon with the trophy. <laughs> Watching it back today, the trophy seems, well, a little uninspiring, just a brick atop a pedestal. Frankly, it didn't really matter to Gordon, and we had a good laugh about it. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> underwhelming. <laughs> yeah. okay. Just a tiny little brick. Yeah, there's not a lot to it. But maybe we should consider the small trophy appropriate. NASCAR's trophy couldn't appear as an equal to that of the Indy 500. But listen, it, it doesn't matter. The trophy meant a lot. It, you know, I, I don't care how small. They could have given me a little coin, and it would have had just as much meaning to me and represented what that day was like and what that day was like for our race team. The trophy didn't matter. The good old boys from down south had conquered the mecca of IndyCar racing, a feat few thought possible. They captured the enthusiasm in a place not meant for stock cars. Sure, they went slower. You kids would know that. But they proved that something other than IndyCars could race at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It would lead to more incredible memories at the track, including the following year with Earnhardt winning at Indianapolis, and then Dale Jarrett, who won in 1996 and followed his victory with kissing the bricks at the start finish line. Now a tradition in all series at the famed Brickyard. Sure, things have changed and NASCAR drivers have competed on the road course there in recent years, but they returned to the Oval for the Brickyard's 30th anniversary. It brings back great memories of one of NASCAR's greatest moments. Driving around, seeing the grandstands, it seemed like, you know, it was just standing room only all the way around that place, inside and out. Uh, that, that was emotional. That was, it was just one of the coolest moments in racing that I've ever been a part of. 
race fans, thanks for watching our video. For all NASCAR on Fox News content and the best clips from Fox Sports, be sure to follow and subscribe to our channel.